Good morning, this is Pastor Dan. Thank you for taking time to share with us uh, this message and listen. Just ask the Lord that you would mightily move on our hearts and our lives to be receptive to the written word of God, to give us wisdom and understanding that we may go forth in such a time as this. We look to you, O Lord, for your goodness, your mercy, and for your will to be done in our life. The kingdom of God. Jesus said the Father was his good pleasure and will to give the kingdom to us. Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven being at hand. He taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. What does that mean? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, especially when we're praying. it. Is that just poetic? Is that just a nice uh, sounding uh, prayer? It kind of gives us a piece of comfort or something. Or is it really what we're really praying fervently for? Is this really what we want to see come about. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, I don't know about you, but it seems like there's a lot of stuff going on that doesn't have anything to do with the kingdom of heaven and the will of God being done in our country. But I think it started back with individuals and with churches and I want to kind of talk about that today. So imagine God's will be done on earth as it is in, is in heaven. Can you imagine God says, Gabriel, I'd like you to go talk to Daniel. Gabriel says, oh, I'm kind of tired. You know, I've been on a lot of assignments lately. And, you know, George over there, he, he hasn't done anything. Why don't you call him? He's been wanting to do something anyway. I mean, can you imagine the angels arguing with God and complaining and negotiating? I don't think so. I think it's okay. And they go. So is that the way it happens for us? Do we, um, we take the things of God and we negotiate with him? Or are we obedient children? This is something that I think has to happen in us. The kingdom come, the will be done in us. Not just in the earth, but starting with us and moving out into our sphere of influence and into our communities and nation and into the world. We have a lot of um, silly stuff that goes on. I want to stop for a moment and take a look at uh, the scripture here where Jesus told his disciples, this is the way I'd like you to pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now let's think about that. God's name is holy. And one of the commandments is, thou shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. And, and we all kind of understand when they say GD or JC or anything else. That's taking it vainly, and that's not good. But it's also a warning that you didn't swear by God and, and take it lightly. It, you, it wasn't a vain thing. And to be called Christian is to take the name of our Savior and the kingdom of God and represent him, and it should not be in vain. It should not defile. Our youngest daughter... Uh, when asked by her friends why she was going to do something, she said, because it would bring uh, a bad reproach on my family on their name. We never even talked about that with her. She just had this sense of what was important uh, for her mother and father, who she was a representative of. And so for her understanding the kingdom of God, she's representing the kingdom of God. 
And when David sinned, God said, you've given my enemies a great occasion to uh, blaspheme my name. So it's important for us that if we're going to name ourselves as believers, as Christians, that we then should represent the kingdom of God and his righteousness accordingly and not uh, make his name unworthy and defiled or just a vain thing that's flippantly used. It needs to be taken into full consideration. Are we going to call ourselves Christian? Then we should be doing what the Father's kingdom and his will is all about, living in his kingdom and its righteousness 24-7. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is heaven. This is our main emphasis. But here's the other part of this prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Many people are looking to the government to give them their daily bread. They're looking to everybody else to give them their bread. And yet God wants us to be relying upon him. Bread, physical needs. Jesus said, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all your physical needs the Father will give to you because he knows you have need of them. We don't seek God's kingdom and his righteousness, so we're often uh, impoverished and we have to go seeking you know, government subsidies or something else. And we put our trust in economics or retirement packages and our bank account that's a dangerous place to be we should be relying upon god day by day and that's the humility and that's the faith in the goodness of our father he also taught us forgive us our debts our sins our trespasses as we forgive those who are indebted to us who trespassed or wronged us and see this is where i think most of us fell in this prayer because it's so easy to hold on to grudges and anger. It's a lot harder to let it go because our pride and we've been wounded. And we want somebody to take notice. And, you know, I can remember thinking, well, if only uh, they'd ask for my forgiveness. But Jesus from the cross forgave those who didn't deserve it. They didn't ask for his forgiveness. He said, Father, forgive them. So they know not what they do. I guess it's hard when we know that people know that they've done wrong. But nonetheless, giving forgiveness, key of our life to stay free. Jesus taught us that if we don't forgive others, then our Father will stop forgiving us. And this is where the church becomes powerless. When we start living in that covenant relationship that freely receive forgiveness, freely give forgiveness, freely God has given to you, freely give to others. And when that part of this prayer is negated, well, we probably aren't living up with the above, and we're not glorifying the next part of this to God's glory. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For in thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God's not the one that wants to bring us into temptation. We, when we turn aside from our lust, James says, we're tempted. And we have to crucify that. We have to bring it to the cross, deny ourselves, and follow the Lord Jesus in righteousness. And walk even as he walked. He who knew no sin. He rejected sin when he was tempted. He used the word of God against the temptation and overcame it. And we've been given the power to be the children of God. So temptation, it's going to be there as long as that's what we want to do. And we yield to it, it begins to take and entangle us again. So right here we can see that our reliance on God when it's no longer that we're humble and reliant on God, we're not forgiving others, and we're playing around with the temptation and the lust of the flesh, we're not giving God the glory in our life, and his kingdom come, his will be done in us as it is in heaven, isn't happening. You think the people in heaven are sitting around watching pornography? You think the people in heaven are sitting around rioting? You think that they're doing the things of this earth or that they're doing the things of the kingdom? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is it being done in us? Often it's not. So we look at 
God's will being done. And so my question is, are we part of the kingdom of God? Or are we separating ourselves from this? Do we represent the kingdom of God? Or do we represent our own little kingdoms? See, self is, is something that has to be conquered and brought to the cross. And, and, and as we try to save our life, Jesus says you'll lose it. But if you'll give up yourself, your life, I'll give you an abundant life. Part of why we don't have abundant life is because we're not denying ourselves and following him and letting the cross bring us to the crucifixion of our own will. See, we, we've been called out of darkness into light. We've been called to come into his kingdom and forsake the world and its ways. So do we know what the will of God is? There's, there's the teaching of God that his commandments is his will for the best in our life. Loving God with all of our heart, with all of our might, with all of our soul, our being, and to love others as we'd like to be loved. So what is our will versus God's will looking like? Is God winning or are we winning? Are we trying to manipulate God's will into our will? That's foolishness, people. That's iniquity. And so are we really seeking the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, the kingdom righteousness in our life, in our thinking, in our attitude? Are we still holding on to the world and our will be done, not God's? There's an evil kingdom, and it appears right now wickedness is prevailing right in front of us. And, and we're seeing, you know, what we're seeing happening in, the, in America right now is not the kingdom of God and his righteousness. This is something else. This is something very nefarious. This is a communistic type move to overthrow the Constitution, overthrow the law and order, to get rid of Christianity, to get rid of God. And the party that has been doing that, well, I can't hide it. It's not the one that starts with the R, but the one that starts with the V. Now, I don't like everything that goes on in the R party, but I definitely look at what they're trying to do in the other party, and they have openly denounced God. They are openly in opposition to God. They're killing the innocent. Are you voting for that so that you get a better Social Security check or more benefits or more what? Is there covenants in your heart for what others have? And is that why you're, you're empowering this kingdom? This is the kingdom of darkness. We are the light. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, and in him, we're supposed to be a light, a city set on a hill that can be seen in dark times and hard times. So what happens when we do not shine, or we start putting the bush over uh, the light? Remember, the, when God started creation, the Spirit of God began to move, and then he spoke, let there be light. The Word of God brings light. So we often don't like the Word of God because it confronts our lust, our sin, our unforgiveness, our bad attitudes. And so we want to try to shift and cover per parts of the Bible. That's why you hear these false teachers saying the Bible's not relevant today. It's too divisive. Hey, they're just not God's uh, teachers. They're not really of God. They don't want the light. They want to put a bushel over it. They want to hide it. And the same thing with our attitude and our actions and how we go about living in the world. We are the salt of the earth. If we lose our savor, Jesus said we're no longer good for the earth and men will throw us out and trot over us. And that's happening. We're seeing that, that uh, even the churches and people are trying to appease the world and the movements. We see people yelling, but I'm on your side. They don't care. Ultimately, the destruction of human life and reducing people from being free and able to choose God will be taken from our land because so many people no longer want God in their life or in their country, and they want something for nothing. And the church has become like that, and the church wants to be the friend of the world. And we're going to be overthrown, and you're going to have to, you won't have any light, you won't have any salt, and this nation will be destroyed, and millions of people are going to be murdered. And your children and grandchildren are going to be turned into sex slaves because you voted for evil. You've 
compromised righteousness. Who do we empower and stand with? Well, Pastor, we're not into politics. I, I'm, I beg your pardon, but you are involved in politics. This is a nation set up with a government of democracy, of the people, by the people, for the people. And if you are not active in it, making people disciples in the kingdom, we are called to make nations disciples. The nation, we influence. We're supposed to be influencing the nation. We're supposed to be involved in the political process of who we're voting for. We're supposed to be making stands for righteousness. And the churches just throw that up because, well, you know, we want to keep our tax exempt status. You know, don't give us our daily bread, Lord. We'll let the government give us our, our daily bread. So the values of the world become the values of the church. The values of God are often tossed to the side or, you know, given lip service to. So it's the ethics of the world. I did a whole teaching on why politics is so wrapped with ethics and that it's not this name calling and this garbage. It's about the ethics that are going on. So the world's ethics, they're fluid, they change, they're good for them, but not good for others. Or the ethics of God are standard for all men. Are we the friends of the world? If we are, we're the enemy of God, according to the Bible. You cannot be a friend of the world and be a friend of God. So what has happened? We've given up the values of God. We've given up the ethics of God. We've given up friendship with God and became his enemy. And that's why evil is reigning right now in the United States. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, people groan. Wickedness doesn't make people happy. In every socialist country that ends up becoming a dictatorship, because if you can't, you cannot, once, once people get what they wanted, they find out that's not what they're going to get. And so they're going to keep the power. They're going to suppress the people who are agitators provocateurs because they know how to do that and they don't want them rising up against them so they often eliminate them first and foremost and they got to get rid of the church and they got to get rid of good teachers and they got to restart with a new generation to indoctrinate because they want absolute control and that's what socialism is designed for to trap people into buying the idea bring it into a communistic dictatorship he that justifies the wicked and he that condemns the just, even they both are an abomination to the Lord. Are you justifying wickedness? Many people in the church are justifying wickedness. Oh, it's okay to burn because black life matters more than property. Since when? Oh, I guess so. So we can destroy people's property. We can kill other people, even if they're black. As long as it's not the police thing. He that condemns the just, well, that's happening. And that's been going on for quite some time in our country. And many people have voted for the people that want to do that. They're both an abomination to God. In other words, these people that do this and those that empower make God sick. They're detestable beings. There are six things that God hates. The seventh one is, that it's, is, is an abomination and is detestable to him. Hachi eyes. Oh, that proud look. I've seen uh, rioters in the face of cops and you look at their eyes and, you know, they're more demonic than human. And they look down on everybody else and they see themselves as being the great savior of mankind and the great equalizers. They have a lying tongue. When we empower lies and begin to let lies take out and we start speaking the same mantra and the same narrative, God hates that. Hands that shed innocent blood. How many of you voted for the party that murders babies? You're shedding innocent blood. In the story, you are shedding innocent blood. You think God's going to take and reward you for that? Is that the kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Are they aborting innocent babies? That's amazing that people buy into the lie and think they're still serving God. You're deceived. 
a heart that devises wicked schemes. We see how our universities have become scheme centers to twist the minds and hearts of the young people. This is nothing more than the evil one using all these wicked schemes, claiming they're good when they are in fact wicked. Feet that are quick to rush into evil. See how quickly the people went from a, a protest into doing evil? And are we supporting that? If you're voting for the party that stands back and says, yeah, let it happen, you are part of the problem. You're not part of the kingdom of God. You're deceived. Repent. Repent and align yourself with the kingdom of God and his values, his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Even though one party over the other have flawed beings, look at the politics. Where are you heading? You want communistic godless rule or do you want the constitutional rule that believes that all men were created by God and created equal? They're either on one side or the other. There's no middle ground anymore that you can even look at. God's against fault witnesses who pours out lies. If you accept the lies and you spout the lies and you share the lies, you march with the lies, you vote with the lies, you, God hates you. Sorry, he hates you. And what is detestable to God? A person who stirs up conflict in the community. Oh my gosh. And we're seeing people complicit to it. Those that should govern and keep the conflict in a peaceable way of protesting as it's supposed to be, to bring about dialogue. But look at the vulgarity and the hate and the conflict that's coming out. That's an abomination to God. If you're voting for that, you're standing with that, you're an abomination to God. You're not part of the kingdom of God. You're part of Satan's kingdom. I want you to get it because I have to stand accountable as a watchman. Like a roaring lion or a charging bear is a wicked ruler over a helpless people. Oh, yes, we've seen the bear of Russia. We've seen Stalin murder millions upon millions upon millions of people. We've seen every socialist movement that became communistic where innocent and helpless people are murdered. And that's what you're voting for. That's what you're marching for. That's what you're championing because the color of your skin or because you're going to get something from the government. Oh, come on. Yeah, then you've rejected God as your provider. You're rejecting the forgiveness that God says, unless you forgive, I won't forgive. Think about this, people. The kingdom of God is so different than the world. What happens as the true church arises in shine? Because not everybody that claims themselves a Christian and says Jesus is Lord, he says, is going to be part of his kingdom. When the wicked rise, men hide themselves. But when they perish, the righteous increase. Perish them. Don't vote for it. Don't empower it. Don't agree with it. Don't support those that support evil. And when that happens, they're going to fade away and righteousness and the kingdom of God starts prevailing again in the life of the land. When the righteous are in authority, people rejoice. We've already talked about when the wicked are. But when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. We need to get involved to have authority. We need to put good, solid Christian into leadership. We need to encourage good Christian leaders. And whether or not we agree with them 100% of the party, we got to look at what righteousness is, but what represents closer to the kingdom of God's will happening in the earth than the kingdom of darkness. The effect of true justice, because there's a lot of people crying, uh, no peace to tell their justice, but their justice is to kill other people, beat up other people, rob other people, destroy their businesses, burn down their homes, let babies die in the fire. All of you people that support that stuff, you're going to answer to God for standing by and allowing it to happen. Because when justice is done, it's a joy to the righteous, but it's a terror to evildoers. Right now, there's no true justice going forth. So evil's having dominion. 
But when true justice comes from righteousness of God's people, here's a warning. If you forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death and those who are ready to be slain, guess what? You get this communistic party and there's going to be a lot of innocent blood and people who are going to be delivered over and murdered. If thou say, behold, we knew not, did not God that ponders the heart consider it? And he that keeps thy soul, does he not know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? It's time for us to wake up. God knows. You know. If you read the word of God and you pray, if you're a true believer with the true spirit of truth in you, you know what's going on. And you're really praying for the kingdom to come, the will of God be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you want that in your life. And you're not going to buy the lie. And you're not going to empower the evil ones who spout the lies, whose only aim and gain is power and destruction of God's kingdom come upon the earth. That's what they're trying to do. Stop God's kingdom from coming forth. When he judges the world in righteousness, he will execute judgment for the people with equity. In other words, there's not going to be one race more important or less important. There's not going to be one closer or one class, less or not. He's going to give us equality that he wants. And that's what's happening when the kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, is implemented and fought for by the body of Christ. And see, you can't just sit back and I'm not going to be involved in politics. It's, you're involved whether you like it or not. They're coming for you. Just like Nazi Germany came for those who sat quietly. Just like the poor people in Russia and China when the communists took over. They weren't trying to fight them, but it didn't matter. They didn't want them around. And so, underground or die. Father, I ask that your spirit of truth will grab our hearts and, and convict us that we need to allow your kingdom come, your will be done in us first, that we align ourselves with your righteousness, that we seek your kingdom first and your righteousness first, not our own well-being first. Jesus said when we put the kingdom first and the righteousness of God first, you're the one that provides for us, not the government. Lord, may we get rid of that idolatry that the government is our provider. You're our provider. We want to establish good rulers. The scripture talks about making sure the rulers are good. And it's up to us as a people to make the vote that counts, to agree with righteousness, to stand against that which is against God, to stand for the kingdom of God first and his righteousness above all other things here and now we're supposed to be the light and the salt we cannot take the the coward's way out we can't sit back and try to appease the world because then we're the enemy of god and god will let us reap a whirlwind of destruction in our life and judgment father come set us free from the lies of the world and the enemy that we bought into let your truth set us free and give us victory for whom the Sun sets free, is free indeed. Untangle us from our wickedness, Lord. Show us what we need to do to make it right. Change our life, Lord. Make us righteous in you, O Lord. Let us walk rightly before you. Let us bring about the kingdom principles in our life and in our vote, in our communities, and in our churches and around the world, Lord. Till your kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, just as it is in heaven. Forgive us, Lord, for just giving you lip service and not being active, being involved in making disciples of all nations, especially in our own, Lord. We've stopped making disciples who understand who you are, understand your will, and want righteousness. We've completely failed that mandate. Help us, O oh Lord, repent of that and do what is right once again in your eyes. Well, this is Pastor Dan wishing you and yours a very good day. And we ask now 
the Lord's blessings to continue upon you this week and every week uh, to come. We pray that you find the kingdom of God as part of your life. In Jesus' name, amen.